Haven Arrest Missionary Baptist Church presents Union Gospel Press's Sunday School Lesson Number 9, Sunday, November 1st, 2020. The lesson is entitled, The People's Sin Against God. Lesson text comes from Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. Related scriptures are Acts 7, 39 through 43, Nehemiah 9, 16 through 18, Psalms 9, 7 through 10, 106, 19 through 23. The place is Mount Sinai. The time is 1445 BC. Whenever we teach about sin, our students may become nervous. We must be careful not to become judgmental or accusing, yet without being afraid to confront sin. Much of the surrounding culture does not believe there is such a thing as sin, and our students have certainly been affected by this. We have then a serious opportunity to present what scripture says about God's view of sin and his response to it. Today's aim. Facts. To see clearly that sin is offensive to God. Principle. To understand how God responds to the sin of his people. Application. To anticipate God's response to our sin and what we need to do about it. Illustrating the lesson. Our, by grace, our sins can be blotted out through Christ's blood, but not if we deny them or try to avoid facing up to them. Practical points. One, trials and delays can tempt us to try to shape God to fit our own imaginations. Exodus 32, 1 through 3. Two, when God's word conflicts with popular opinion, believers must stand with the word, verses 4 through 5. Three, believers cannot mix worship of the true God with immoral practices, verse 6. Four, idolatry corrupts people and separates them from God, verses 7 through 9. Five, man's actions do not alter God's faithful and holy nature, verse 10. Six, godly leaders intercede for those who have turned away from God, verse, verses 11 through 13. Seven, God's grace and mercy often spare people from tragic but deserved consequences, verse 14. Golden text. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. Psalms 9, 10. Today we have two lesson outlines. The first is Israel's rebellion, Exodus 32, 1 through 6. And the second is the Lord's response, Exodus 32, 7 through 14. Introduction. Many of us can tell with sadness of a family and friends who once professed faith in Christ, but now show no signs of genuine faith. Even if there once were some outward signs of following Christ, they now show no interest in him, the Bible or Christian fellowship. They may even have renounced the faith they once spoke of with reverence. There are many possible reasons for such a sad turn. In retrospect, we might realize some of these people saw God merely as a way of escape from very difficult circumstances and soon found that those circumstances did not suddenly disappear. Some may have been responding as they did simply to meet the expectations of others. We might find that some of these people actually have a degree of faith, but it is faith in other people rather than God. This seems to be the case with the Israelites of the Exodus generation. They were quick to agree to follow the Lord and all he commanded, but the events in Exodus 32 suggest that their faith was not really in God, but in their mortal leader Moses. When he disappeared for a time, they forgot even the most basic of God's commands. Israel's Rebellion, Exodus 32, 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wrought not what is become of him. Verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Verse 3. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. 
verse 4. And he received them at their hand and fastened it with a graving tool. After he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 5. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Verse 6. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. The people's demand, Exodus 32.1. The Israelites had left Egypt and made their way south to Mount Sinai. God had miraculous, miraculously delivered them, provided for them, and given them his personal guidance. At Sinai, the Lord reminded the people of what he had done, and they agreed to obey all his words, 19.8. Later, the people again declared that their commitment to obey the Lord's words, 24.3, and repeated it a third time when the covenant with the Lord was confirmed with sacrifices, verse 7. Shortly after that, Moses went up the mountain and entered the divine presence at the, at the top of Sinai alone, 24.18. He, re he remained there for 40 days and 40 nights. During that 40-day period, the Lord gave him detailed revelation concerning the tabernacle, the priesthood, and Israel's worship, 21.5 through 31.17. At the very end of Moses' time on the mountain, the Lord gave him two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God, 31.18. These stone tablets contain the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy 4.13, a summary of God's requirements for his people. In the opening of Exodus 32, the scene shifts back to the people at the base of the mountain. From their perspective, Moses had delayed to come down out of the mount, verse 1. After waiting for 40 days, they had given up on seeing him return to them and went to Aaron with a request. Aaron, Moses' older brother, had long served as his spokesman. Along with her, Aaron had been left in charge of the Israelites while Moses was on the mountain with the Lord, 24, 13-14. The people honored Aaron's position as of leadership, but the request they made of him is startling. Only about four months after their miraculous deliverance from Egypt, and a little more than a month after proclaiming all the words which the Lord have said, will we do, 24-3, they demanded something that God explicitly forbade in his covenant, 24. Apparently, through spokesmen, the people said to Aaron, make us gods which shall go before us, 32-1. They justified their request by saying they did not know what had become of Moses, the man who had brought them out of Egypt. The people's request seems shocking, but perhaps it should not be. The reason they gave for making it indicates they had placed their trust in God's servant rather than in God himself. Moses' absence clearly had played on their weak and misplaced faith. Although they had repeatedly complained against him, they recognized him as the one who gave stability and hope to the nation. With their leader gone, they wanted a visible God to lead them. The call to make gods does not mean they had completely abandoned the Lord in preference for other gods. The plural form can refer to the one true God, as suggested by verse 4. Still, what they wanted clearly was idolatry and a violation of the first three commandments. They desired the very thing God had condemned and shown by the plagues on Egypt to be useless, 12.12. Aaron's Capitulation, Exodus 32, 2-3. Even more shocking than the people's request was Aaron's response. He readily gave in and urged the people to donate the gold needed to make an idol. There is no indication Aaron even objected to what the people were asking. He did not go to the Lord as Moses so often did when faced with the nation's rebellion. He simply gave in to the pressure. Her, on the other hand, her, the other man Moses left in charge in his absence, is not mentioned at all. It is impossible to know exactly what that means. However, Aaron, who had stood faithfully beside Moses throughout the plagues, the exodus, 
in the challenges in the wilderness was unwilling to stand alone against the people. Aaron serves as a warning to us all. It may be easy to follow a good, godly, and strong leader, but it is not so easy to stand alone for the truth. The pressures are great to compromise, surrender, or remain silent. We need to encourage one another and prepare ourselves fully, expecting our faith to be challenged by a threatening majority. It is unclear how many people actually participated in this rebellious episode. Exodus 32:28 indicates that about 3,000 men died as a result of the idolatry in the camp. If this represented all those directly involved, it was not a large percentage of the people who probably numbered over 2 million, 1237. However, it was a sizable number and enough to intimidate Aaron, especially if no one else voiced opposition. Perhaps a small mitigating factor can be observed. It may be that Aaron thought to stop the movement by demanding that the people contribute their gold earrings as material to make the image and was caught by his own demand when the people complied. There were, they were willing to sacrifice their gold in order to have a visible God lead them. That all the people did this, 32.3, does not mean every single person did. The Hebrew expression often means all sorts of. The idol and the altar, Exodus 32, 4-5. Aaron melted down the gold and fastened it with the, with the graving tool into the image of a calf. This probably means a wooden form was overlaid with gold. The idea of a gold calf may well have come from the Egyptian worship. However, Aaron clearly identified the image with the God who had brought Israel out of Egypt. He said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. This could be translated as singular, this is your God. Such an understanding makes sense since Aaron, since Aaron then built an altar and declared the next day a feast to the Lord Yahweh. It appears both Aaron and the people were trying to, just, to justify their actions by declaring this idol to be a representation of the true God. They were still claiming to worship Yahweh Jehovah, but they had a physical form to receive their worship. Such thinking is terrible, terribly perverse, however. One who seeks to worship God must worship him as he has prescribed. The Lord forbids idolatry, even if it's in his name, for it distorts the true image and character of God. The people's worship, Exodus 32, 6. The following day, the people rose early to present offerings on the altar before the golden idol. They feasted and they rose up to play. This expression probably refers to immoral activities that were often associated with the religions of Egypt and Canaan. While the Israelites did not seek to abandon their belief in the Lord, they sought to worship him the way others worship their gods. Such idolatry has nothing in common with the true God. It only lowers him to the level of man-made gods of wood and stone. By making and bowing down before the golden calf, the people were guilty not only of idolatry, but also of rebellion, unbelief, immorality, and ultimately of breaking God's covenant with them. The Lord's response, verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Verse 8. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 9, And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Verse 10, Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Verse 11, And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why dost thou wax hot against thy people. 
which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Verse 12. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against the people. Verse 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Verse 14. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto the people. Informing Moses, Exodus 32, 7 through 8. At this point in the narrative, the scene shifts back to Moses on the mountain. He had been isolated from the people for 40 days as he met with the Lord. He did not know what was going on in the camp below. The Lord knew, of course, and he told Moses to get back down to the people, informing him that they had corrupted themselves. This same expression is used in Genesis 6:12 to describe the wickedness of the people in Noah's day. God then described exactly how the people had corrupted themselves. They had made an idol and proclaimed it to be their God. Only weeks after declaring their allegiance to the Lord, they had been all too quick to turn away from his command. Testing Moses, Exodus 32, 9-10 In speaking to Moses, the Lord described the people as stiff-necked. This frequently used description pictures people being as obstinate as a horse that stiffens its neck against the reins, resisting the rider's direction. The Lord then presented an astonishing proposal. He said, Let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them. Verse 10. He would then start over by making from Moses a great nation. In a sense, in a sense this proposal seems quite reasonable in view of the people's rejection of God's standards. However, God was actually prompting Moses to intercede for the people by telling him to stand aside so that he could destroy the people. God had never intended to kill the people, but his anger showed that they deserved to be killed, and his appeal to Moses showed that forgiveness was available. Saying that he would start over again was Moses, with Moses was both a prompt for the intercession and a test. Would Moses choose his own exhortation and comfort over the well-being of the people God put in his care, or would he appeal to God to spare them? This was the test. Listening to Moses, Exodus 32, 11-13 The choice God placed before Moses did not seem to create a dilemma for Israel's leader. He immediately responded as demanded by his role as Israel's appointed shepherd. He did not abandon the people for self-serving purposes, but interceded with God on their behalf. In doing so, he offered three arguments for why God should spare the people. First, Moses reminded the Lord that the people belonged to him. The Lord had spoken of Israel as thy Moses' people when he informed him of their sin, verse 7. Moses reversed this now, stating that they were thy God's people, verse 11. That these people uniquely belonged to the Lord was evident from his miraculous and powerful deliverance of them from Egypt. His personal ownership of them argued against destroying the people. Second, Moses appealed on the basis of the Lord's honor. Were he, were he to destroy the people, the Egyptians would mock both him and the Israelites. They would delight in declaring that Israel's God had brought them out of Egypt just to slay them in the mountains, verse 12. Thus, the humiliated Egyptians, though unable to deny his power, could impugn God's character and portray him as no different from their capricious and vengeful gods. On this basis, Moses pleaded with God to turn away from his wrath and his evil against the people. Evil, both here and in verse 14, simply refers to the threatened judgment, not to moral evil. Third, Moses' strongest argument was that in destroying the people, God would violate his own promise to Abraham and Isaac. 
the Lord had promised to make from them a great nation with many descendants who would be given a land forever. Genesis 12, 2, 26, 2 to 5. To annihilate them and start over, making a great nation out of just Moses would contradict God's oath. Relenting of judgment, Exodus 32, 14. Moses was on solid ground in his appeal. God would not and could not destroy the people. Moses passed the test. He prayed for God to have mercy on his people. And this is exactly what God wanted and expected him to do. In writing this account, Moses used human terms to describe divine actions, which is why he wrote in verse 14 that God repented. The Hebrew word means to grieve, to be sorry, Genesis 6.6, 6, 1 Samuel 15.29, and describes God's change of approach in dealing with his people, Jeremiah 18, 1-12, 19.26. God's character doesn't change. But God does respond to the prayers and confessions of his people. Questions. 1. What did the Israelites ask Aaron to do? 2. How did Aaron respond? 3. How did Aaron describe the golden calf when he presented it? 4. How did Aaron seek to justify his actions? Five, what was wrong with the way the people worshiped? Six, how did the Lord describe the people and their actions to Moses? Seven, what did God propose to Moses? Eight, in what sense was this proposal a test for Moses? Nine, what was Moses' strongest argument for why God should spare the people? 10. How did Moses pass the test? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, November 1st, 2020. Thank you for listening. God bless.